My name is Gary Russell. I'm the project lead on the Spring AMQP project, as well as Spring Integration and Spring Kafka. Um, we're here today for a pretty short talk, just uh, on, on what's new in Spring AMQP. Is, is everybody here using Spring AMQP? Some? Well, OK. This is, for those of you that aren't yet, it, this is our abstraction. It was originally intended to be a general abstraction over, over, AMQ, over the AMQP protocol, but AMQP 1.0 evolved from the 0 0.91, and so it's a completely different protocol. Um, this, so really, this is really just our abstraction over the RabbitMQ Java client. Um, just for, for the, the news is, though, that we, we're getting more and more interest in AMQP 1.0, so there may be something happening next year in terms of a general uh, 1.0 support for and We've got several uh, vendors that are interested in collaborating with us uh, on doing that, but this talk is purely about um, Spring for Rabbit MQ, essentially. And it's been uh, since the last Spring 1, since we had a new, a new release, so it's been a while, but this is the 2.0 release. The reason we've bumped from 1.7 to a major 2.0 is that this is the release that um, sits on top of Spring Framework 5 and requires Java 8. So um, that's the sort of baseline requirement. Um, I'm really just going to go to the, the reference manual and just step through some of the important changes in, um, in the project uh, since, since the 1.7 release about 18 months ago. And, uh, Although some, of the, some features did, did get retrofitted back into 1.7 because of requirements that were driven out of um, the, the Spring Cloud Stream project for the, uh, for the Rabbit binder for Spring Cloud Stream. So let's just go, let's go to the, uh, the reference manual. Well, let me uh, shut down my Chrome. So, uh, changes, changes since uh, 1.7. Um, we've now standardized on the, on the Rabbit uh, or the AMQP, um, AMQP client at the 5.0 version. Starting with the 4.0 version, um, the Rabbit team um, decoupled the Java client from the, from the uh, server version. So, um, it's now, it now has its independent release schedule. Um, So that's one thing. Um, the biggest change in this release is a, is a new listener container. Back in, um, and for those of you that aren't using Rabbit, uh, Spring AMQP, just a little bit of history. Spring JMS was the first messaging abstraction. That's in the core Spring Framework project. And it has the notion of a listener container and a uh, template, JMS template and a message listener container. This is to facilitate message-driven POJO. So you just write a plain old Java object, and the listener container handles all the communication with the, um, with the broker and invokes your plain old Java object after doing message conversion or, or whatever's needed to do that. You don't have to get into the details of, of dealing with the message. So um, back in uh, the early versions of the, of the uh, AMQP client, uh, I think 2.7 and before, there was, a, there was an issue with um, a consumer that blocked a delivery could, could impact other, uh, other consumers. So the initial design of the listener container, which was before my time on the project, was to use an internal queue within the, within the container. So when a message arrives from the Rabbit client, we put it into a queue and then a, a separate thread uh, polled that queue, essentially, and then when messages arrived, uh, invoked your listener. Um, that f problem or that, that issue with the client was resolved way back in, in the sort of 2.8 time frame of the, uh, of the client, but it was a fairly major re-architecting of the listener container to, to change 
its behavior to, uh, to, to take advantage of that fix in the client. So uh, because we knew there was a, a sort of longer time frame between 1.7 and 2.0 going out, we decided to, uh, to actually bite the bullet and, and create a new implementation of, of the listener container. Now, ironically, the original listener container was called Simple, simple Message Listener Container. Um, in actuality, the, the, it's, it's a lot more complex than that. It's not simple at all because of this thread um, dance and uh, managing the, the con uh, consumer threads. So that we, we, we couldn't really call it a simpler message listener container. So we just chose this name, direct message listener container. The implication there is your listener now is invoked directly on the consumer thread that the, uh, that the AMQP client um, invokes us with. There are some, there are some subtle differences, uh, some which may be resolved in the future, some which may not. But uh, there's a um, there's a chapter in, or there's a section in the book. Um, uh, let me refresh this now. I've changed that. Yeah. Oh, come on. There it is. It's a direct link. So we have this chapter, Choosing a Container, where we just talk about the differences in the containers. There are some minor differences in the configuration. Um, but the two, the two uh, really important differences are that the simple message listener container, the existing message listener container that was, that's always been there since 1.0, can dynamically scale. That was added in, I know, 1.3 one, one or 1.4, where you have a, a concurrent consumers and max concurrent consumers. And if the workload increased, if we detected that we, 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 we're, we seem to have a lot of messages, there's no, there are no situations where we, we didn't have a, uh, a message arrive, then we start increasing the consumer threads. And that actually works pretty well. On the other side, when the container um, volume of data slows down, it's a little bit more tricky to, to uh, shut down consumers because of the way that the, the Rabbit uh, broker distributes the work. So effectively, if we, if we ramp up from five to 10 consumers and you've still got a reasonable amount of work going through, we, we will still keep 10, 10 consumers up. If the container goes idle, the complete container, you get no messages at all, then we'll start throttling back the, uh, the consumers. But that's only with the simple message list in the container. We, we don't have any, because we don't really control the threading, it's just messages arrive from the AMQP client, we don't currently have uh, any, any way to, to scale the, the consumers up or down. Um, the second thing that's, that's different between the, the fir between the old container and the new is there's this um, notion of transaction size. That actually has two meanings in the simple message listener container. Um, it's how often we send acts. So if you set the transaction size to, size to 20, then we'd only send an act to the broker every 20 messages. So that can increase performance, but it can give you, it increases the possibility of duplicate deliveries if you have a failure uh, in, in the middle there. And if you have transactions enabled, then the second notion of the transaction size is how often we do a commit. In the case of the, the direct message list in the container, um, we, we do have uh, um, messages per ACK, which is the same as transaction size on the, on the simple message list in the container, only send an ACK every 20 messages, for example. But we don't have an equivalent of this, of this only commit after 20 messages. Because in effect, when a message arrives into the container, we start the transaction. We invoke your listener, and then we commit the transaction. We don't have any way to defer that transaction commit um, because it, we, we lose scope. So, so that, but that's, that's just the way it is. So that's, that's the limitation. If you're using transactions, then you might want to lean back towards using the, the simple message listener container. Um, however, the direct message listener container, aside from not having this thread half, so you've got better performance potentially, um, 
adding queues at runtime is more efficient. At, at 1.5 or 1.6, we added the ability to um, add queues to a running container and, uh, and remove queues from a running container without, um, without having to stop the container, reconfigure it, and restart it. Before we added that, that's what you had to do. You have to stop the container, reconfigure it, and then bring it up again. However, with the simple message list in the container, we effectively do that. So when you change the queue um, profile and a number of queues that we're listening to, then we effectively shut down the existing consumers, reconfigure internally, and then bring them up. Um, it's not very efficient. So with the, the new direct message, message listener container, if you're in this, um, if you have applications in a case where you want to dynamically modify the queues, then this is a good candidate for using the direct message listener container because we just add new consumers. When you, when you, when you add a new queue, we just add a new consumer. When you remove a queue from the list of queues, then, then we remove that con consumer. So the context sw switch is avoided, and the um, modifying the queues at runtime is mo much more efficient. And finally, the threading model is much more efficient in terms of if you have large concurrency or a large number of containers. Um, with, with the simple message list in the container, every consumer instance, so uh, uh, containers times the concurrency within those containers has a separate thread because we have this thread that's, that's polling the, uh, the internal queue to invoke your, invoke your listener. With the direct message listener container, everything's done on the AMQP client's thread pool, um, so that really controls the concurrency. The size of that thread pool in the, in the underlying client determines the total concurrency across all your containers. So you have to be careful to ensure that thread pool is enough to satisfy the, the concurrency of not only one container, but if you've got multiple containers in the application context, then you need a big enough pool to support. But it doesn't have to be, like if you've got 10 containers, each with 10 concurrencies, you don't need a thread pool of 100 anymore, which is what you would have with um, old container. You, but you need to evaluate what the total concurrency would be reasonable uh, and, and you can set the thread pool at that size. So you have much more control over the, uh, over the threading. There's a, there's, a, there's a link here to a section that, that talks about the threading and, and just in, you know, the notes about, about that. So hopefully that, uh, uh, that will tell you. Now, the question is, so, so in, in a Spring Boot environment, how do we, um, how do we choose, right? So, so I have a simple boot app here, and I'll, I'll just walk through it. Um, it's a very simple boot app. It's got an application runner that, that uses Boot's auto-configured rabbit template to convert and send a message from a string to, a, to the underlying message format, sends it to, excuse me, sends it to, uh, to rabbit. And then we have the simple listener, annotated listener method uh, that listens on that queue. As usual, just using normal Spring, the, the, the Rabbit admin that Boot gives us, we're just uh, declaring the queue here, so um, uh, the application will, will declare that queue on the broker when we come up. It's an auto-delete queue, so it'll, it'll go away when the application stops. Um, so, so let's run it just, to, uh, just for yucks. And simple enough, we sent foo, we got, we got foo on the output. Big, big deal. Now, the question is, I, we're really talking here about, about listener containers. So I have a breakpoint on, on this listener. If we run it in uh, debug mode, we'll see down, down in the stack trace here, we're running on a simple message listener container. So for backwards compatibility with, uh, with Boot 2.0, we decided not to automatically switch you to the new listener container because, uh, because of the, the, the subtle differences. And you, you know, if you're using scale up, scale down, you don't want to use that. So, um, so the default is simply to uh, use a simple message listener container. If you want to switch to the new container, it's simple as going into your application YAML or application properties file and just set the listener type. 
If you're, using, if you're not using at rabbit listener annotations, then obviously you just change the bean definition that you have for your listener container from, um, from a simple message listener container to a direct list message listener container. The, um, the XML configuration also, if you're still using XML, there's a type on the listener so that you can uh, determine which type you want. And now if we run it, Now we're running on a direct search. So it's as simple as that to switch, switch between the two. And so hopefully, you know, give it a try. And if it, it, you, may, you may get some uh, performance boost, you may benefit from some of the, uh, from some of the other things like the, the reduced uh, number of threads in your application. Any questions on that? So going back to our, our what's new, let's uh, scroll down to a few more uh, interesting things. Um, we deprecated the log4j, well, we, sorry, we removed the log4j appender because log4j has, um, has gone out of life now. Obviously, we have a log4j2 appender and a logback appender. Um, there's some minor, minor changes in there. Um, let me, uh, do we... expecting to see. I'm going to go to listen to changes first. Um, one one uh, question that we have is that it, using, when you're using at rabbit listener, we have a listener container factory that, um, that boot wires in for you, or you can configure yourself, and you can, in, in, you can add an error handler to that. But if you want to have different error handling for each listener, then you would need to create multiple factories and then reference that in the, uh, in the listener. We can now, uh, at the annotation level, add a, an, error handler, um, an error handler to the annotation. And it's just the bean name of an error handler that actually implements rabbit listener error handler. And in this case, um, all it's doing is just printing out that, that we got this exception. But now instead of throwing the exception back to the container and going through container recovery, sending it to a DLQ or what have you, you can now just simply add an error handler. So you, you're effectively you're removing the error handling code from your business logic. You just throw the exception there, and we redirect to, to this method. Um, when, when an exception is thrown. So if I run that. Oh, <laughs> I need to change it to throw an exception. That would help. So just it just the the, the 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 listener adapter catches the exception, calls the error handler. Now, if if this was a um, request reply and you were actually sending a reply here, your error handler can also uh, return. So you can use the error handle to return some different results. So let's say you're sending back some kind of JSON object uh, to the client, you could actually send an error reply to the client if you're using request reply. So the, the error handle itself can return a different reply. It can rethrow the exception so that the container sends a message to a DLQ. You can throw a new, a new exception or a different exception if you want. Um, on the rabbit template, um, we've always had this uh, this notion of convert and send. So you can, if you're doing a request reply, which I was just discussing, um, let's go to the, the other app. We have, we have convert, send, and receive operations on the rabbit template, which converts the sent message um, and returns it, but, it, but it's not, it's not um, typed. So there's no generic type. You just get back an object, so you'd have to cast. So we now have these new methods um, convert, send, and receive as type, and you can provide it with this parameterized type reference. This is actually much more useful if, if you've got some complex uh, return type, you know, such as list of foo, and, and we, it, can, it can handle all that. But 
But for now, let's just, uh, let's just talk about uh, we want to return a foo. And I, I've done a bit of a kludge here. So um, first thing I'm doing is, is uh, I have a, um, a, a JSON message converter. I'm not declaring it as a bean because if I did that, Spring Boot would auto wire it into both containers and the Rabbit template. I don't really want. I don't want it in the container because I'm I'm sort of trying to demonstrate that if you're talking to a foreign or a non-Spring application and it doesn't, let's say, it doesn't set the content type. This actually came up on Stack Overflow in the last week or so. Somebody couldn't control the the responding system and it wasn't set in the the content type. So. Um, what, what my, my sort of pretend remote system does here is it, it gets in this, it gets in, because the, uh, j the message template is, is going to convert to JSON, my little uh, reply thing um, converts it um, from this input message. So, it, so it, un it decodes the JSON and back into the string foo. And then I'm sort of manually constructing some JSON here but there's no content type. Like You're just going to get back um, text plain because the listener container has the default message converter, so it's going to come back as text plain. Well, if it comes back as text plain, the JSON converter that's wired into the template won't know to convert it from JSON, so we'd just get a string. So what I'm doing here, and this is sort of a trick that we can do on the Rabbit template, is to set these after receive post processes. So we get the message from the uh, broker, we convert it into a Spring MQP message, and now we can do some post processing on it. So I'm just basically saying, I know the remote system is going to send me JSON, so I'm going to set the content type so it plays nicely with the, uh, with the converter. And now we can say uh, convert send and receive as type, and we want to receive back a type foo, and we'll actually get the foo object back. So if I run this, and, and foo is just a, just a little domain object here with, with one field, and I've got a two string, and so sure, sure enough, we see in here, on the receiving side, uh, we receive this value bar as a string, and then we actually, on the receiving side, we got a foo object back. So adding, adding this sort of type information to the convert and send and receive makes the uh, um, makes those operations. And the same, the same capability is available on simple receive operations. So if you're doing pull type uh, uh, requests rather than running in a listener container, then, um, uh, then, then, then that's how to do that. Um, the at some point, uh, maybe three, four, the, uh, the broker added a notion of direct reply to. Spring uh, AMQP, when we're doing request reply um, scenarios, in, in early versions of the uh, framework, we created a temporary, anonymous, just a, basically an anonymous queue, an auto-delete queue that would be, serve as the reply queue, put that in the reply to header, send the message off, get the reply, um, and then um, the temporary queue would be deleted. So we created a temporary queue. That wasn't very efficient. So in a later iteration, we actually combined the rabbit template with the listener container and internally did correlation. So we had this notion of a, we called it a reply listener. So, so we have the rabbit template, and we configure a listener container with the rabbit template being the, template being the, the, the listener. So we could use a single reply queue um, for all replies, much more efficient than creating a new queue for, for every request. Works great, um, but fortunately, the, uh, the Rabbit guys added a new ca uh, capability called direct, re direct reply to, um, to the broker, which basically creates a pseudo queue, which effectively removes the need for having to um, uh, having to use a fixed um, reply to uh, message. Oh, am I in the wrong? I don't know why I keep losing my place in this. Uh... 
Okay. Oh, here we are. So um, this direct reply to is much more efficient, and so there's, in a lot of cases, you don't need to have a fixed reply queue um, uh, to, to handle this. So in, in one six or so, we implemented using direct reply queue instead of a temporary reply queue, um, and it worked great, but again, in order to use that, we, because, because the template operations were, were um, one at a time, we ended up creating a consumer for that uh, direct reply to and then deleting it so, and canceling it. So we, we'd be creating a consumer. So although we weren't creating a, a new queue every time, we were creating a, a new consumer every time. And um, so there were still cases where, you know, from a performance perspective, using a fixed queue might, might make more sense. But with the advent of the new direct uh, message listener container, we now have a second one, a, a direct reply to message listener container, which is used internally in the, uh, in the Rabbit template, which basically has a permanent um, consumer on that uh, direct reply to pseudo queue. So um, again, it avoids the, the, the need to create a consumer on every request. So in many ways, the, the, having the reply listener hookup is no longer necessary, but with, with one caveat, if you want to have something like a, um, if you want to use HA on your reply queue, then, then you might still want to, want to use a, a, a hardwired um, uh, reply queue. Let me see if there are any other important uh, things of note. Um, we, we, we added a, a sort of a transaction wrapper. One of the issues, the way that the Rabbit template works, when you do sends on a Rabbit template, um, we check a channel out of a cache, we do the send, and we put the channel back in the cache. So if you're sending multiple messages, in general, if, if, unless you're in a, a, a highly threaded environment, you're probably going to send everything on the same channel, but there's no guarantee. So if you've got a need for strict ordering, um, you could, you could have issues there because you might have messages going to the broker on different channels. So there's a new, a new um, uh, mechanism through the Rabbit template to, um, we call it scoped operations, where you, you do an execute, and Rabbit template execute, and then every, every uh, Rabbit template operation that you do within the scope of that execute, it's a, it's a Lambda, it's a Java fun functional interface, everything you do within that execute will be performed on the same channel. So that gives you the ability to um, ensure uh, order on the receiving side because everything will go on the same channel. Um, another important change was the, the, the prefetch. Um, prefetch used to be and has been forever defaulted to one, which is uh, not ideal if you, to, from a volume perspective. Um, it's, it's very uh, expensive because it's a round trip to the broker for every message. So Generally, increase in prefetch is, is, a, um, is a good thing to do from a performance perspective. So uh, with the advice of the, of the Rabbit team, we've now, we now default that to 250. However, as this note says, there are cases when you might want to uh, revert back if you're, if you're concerned about, uh, uh, if, you, if you have a low volume app and you've got many instances and you want to get good distribution across those instances, then you might want to reduce it some. And I think, I think given the time, um, that's about. I, I think that's the most most of the of the big hitters on the uh, on this uh, this release. Any questions? Yes, sir. Error handlers and. Message rec well, message recoverer is, uh, if you're using a retry template, there's a spring retry project, re spring retry, uh, the error, the, 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 if, you, if you wire that into the, uh, into the advice chain, if you put a retry interceptor in the advice train, the chain, then that's, it's at a lower level. It's at the application uh, container level, and it's the, the, the message recoverer is called after retries are exhausted. So, so if, we, if you have a, a retry interceptor in the container's advice chain, the default would try three times. Then after the third attempt, if you've provided a message recover, then we'll send it out there. So this, this is, um, 
outside of the scope of that, although it could be, it could be inside the scope of a, of a retry mechanism. But, the, but it's sort of a different, it's a different way of doing the same thing, except this one wouldn't be with retry. Yes, sir? Mm -hmm. Not not as now. We, we're hoping to look into that into 2018 the, because the the uh, rabbit guys themselves are writing a reactive client, and so we, we're going to evaluate what's the best way forward with um, uh, with with adding reactive functionality here. But yes, you're right. In, in, in this version, there is no reactive stuff. Any more questions? Okay, looks like we're all set. Thanks.